Hello, and welcome to this lecture about your ethos as a historian. Your ethos, which we'll define in a moment, is one of your most important characteristics. Unless you operate from a solid ethos, you will not create the trust needed to accomplish the things you want to accomplish in your study of history. Remember, history is not merely the consumption of information about the past, but the communication of interpretations about the meaning of past events. Ethos allows you to do that work, whether you do it professionally or avocationally. Ethos is the most important mark of historic training and will serve you well throughout your life. Let's begin by defining ethos. Ethos is the first of Aristotle's three most renowned rhetorical appeals or modes of persuasion, ethos, logos, and pathos. Whereas logos persuades your audience by reasoning and pathos by the use of emotionally evocative language, ethos establishes your authority through integrity and expertise. Ethos answers the question, why should an audience listen to you or heed your words? Because the rest of this lecture will give you characteristics that define ethos, here are a couple of situations to show what negative ethos can do. Think about your relationship with some source of information that you do not believe. Why don't you believe the source of information? Maybe they've lied or distorted the truth. Either way, because you believe that source plays fast and loose, you find it not trustworthy, so you often summarily dismiss the information they provide. Think of the parable of the boy who cried wolf. At first, the villagers trusted the shepherd boy's ethos, but after he fooled them, they stopped believing him. He lost his authority over the information, and he lost his sheep to the wolf when it did not arrive. For the practicing historian, again, whether you're practicing as a professional or avocationally, you establish your ethos through a combination of ethics and methods. Some of these we can separate to analyze, but most of our discussion will blend attention to ethics and practice. Our concern with ethics as part of your ethos is really about values that historians share. This goes beyond practicing history as a craft. It applies to any kind of knowledge communication. The first step in establishing your authority to be believed is by adopting and demonstrating these shared values. Because we're talking about historians, however, we'll consult the American Historical Association's Statement on Standards of Professional Conduct, the sections on shared values, which you can find online. We can divide these shared values into those concerning integrity and those concerning transparency. A word about the composition of this slide. The phrases you see in quotation marks come from the AHA Statement of Professional Conduct. Characteristics of integrity establish your reputation for trustworthiness. Integrity is another word for rigorous honesty. Such rigorous honesty shows up in how you pursue the goals of the historical discipline, which is critical dialogue with yourself, with other historians, with other readers, and with the evidence. Your integrity comes from both your critical stance, which originates in an attitude of healthy skepticism, and your fair-mindedness. That is, you look beneath the surface in rigorous examination of ideas and evidence, not to win a dispute or to glorify yourself, including showing off how smart you are, but to understand, to seek as much as possible, the truth. Another part of your integrity is to maintain the honesty of the historical record and your use of it. Do not fabricate evidence, the AHA statement joins us, which means we do not invent alter, ignore, remove, or destroy evidence. I add that we do not hide evidence either, and that goes to another set of shared values that we gather under the label transparency. 
Historians don't hide their ideas or evidence. Instead, they leave clear trails for others to follow. Why? Because anything we can know right now is interpretive, limited, and partial for many reasons. This means we recognize that our own work makes a contribution to knowledge. It's not the end of that knowledge. In fact, we want our work to become a stepping stone for others. That cannot happen if we do not leave a clear trail of how we arrived at our interpretations. One way to do that is by acknowledging our intellectual debts to others, usually through accurate and thorough citations. We have a responsibility not just to report that one piece of evidence or one quotation that came from a single source, but also to show others where they can find similar information. This is another reason for citing sources besides protecting yourself from charges of plagiarism. Don't stop with indicating where you got that one idea or data point, but show your readers the other sources you know of that deal with the same information. I know this is difficult to do when you're not had enough time, sometimes months or years, to become familiar with the historical literature on a topic but it is possible for you to expand your own mindset from merely protecting yourself to actively trying to enlighten whomever might read your work. Dealing with the past transparently also requires you to take the people of the past seriously. The past is a foreign country, wrote author L.P. Hartley, a line that historian David Lowenthal used as the title for his 1985 book about the role of history and historical consciousness in our lives. The phrase means we must actively seek to understand what the people of the past, our true subjects in history, thought and how they acted. We are obliged to treat them and the past as historical agents with their own agendas and ideas. We cannot see them as a monolithic, undifferentiated mass. Showing how we accomplish that in any particular piece of research is an obligation also. Let's look now at how the AHA guides us toward a solid ethos of scholarly practice in honest research and honest communication of our findings. The AHA defines scholarship as the discovery, exchange, interpretation, and presentation of information about the past and claims it as the basis of historical practice. The purpose of scholarship is to spread historical knowledge openly through different channels of communication, books, articles, classrooms, exhibits, films, historic sites, meetings, and many other ways. That list is quite broad because knowledge about the past is not limited just to the historical profession. Even so, it's a solid definition with ethical implications that affect all of us in all situations when we produce knowledge about the past. To do so with integrity, we must be aware of our own biases. We have them, and even if we do not dwell on them in our communications, which we can do if we choose, we have to acknowledge them to ourselves. Our biases, which we acquire from race, ethnicity, location, economic and social class, family circumstances, and even the language we speak, act as invisible guiding hands that steer our historical interests and vision. Our biases lead us to look at some things and not at others, to consider some things evidence, but not other things. If we do not examine ourselves for biases and recognize those we expose, we risk limiting and even damaging our research. What we must do instead of falling prey to our biases is to accept the challenge of following sound method and analysis wherever they might lead. This goes beyond following evidence, as if we're in a police drama just waiting for a piece of evidence to turn up. Rather, we apply sound method and analysis and do not quail when they go in directions we did not anticipate. We actively seek out evidence, 
frequently doing more sorting and choosing than uncovering. But when we do that with integrity, we see there might be evidence that alters or even contradicts our hypotheses. Let me explain with a story. A professor of industrialism with whom I worked had written a magnum opus on a Birmingham, Alabama steel company. His book had been peer reviewed and accepted for publication. But during a conversation, he realized another book had just been published about antebellum Alabama politics that might have had something to do with his own work. So he read that book quickly, understood that it blew apart some of his own interpretation. So he pulled his own book from the press and rewrote about a third of it based on the insights from this other work. He was aware of his own biases and followed sound method and analysis to produce a better work than he would have done otherwise, even though it delayed publication by over a year. And that story brings us to a discussion of honest communication. Still, we follow the AHA statement. Remember how we formerly spoke of transparency as an ethical quality? One of the ways you put transparency into practice is to acknowledge what your readers might need to know to completely understand how you arrived at your conclusions. Additionally, we all want to give credit where it's due because scholarship might feel like solitary endeavor, but it's really a collaboration. Telling your readers with whom you collaborated credits your colleagues and shows both the direction and the limits of your work. Acknowledging assistance includes disclosing any financial assistance you may have received. That might be in the form of direct payment or even time off from regular duties without loss of pay. Likewise, acknowledge the people who helped you, including the librarians, archivists, other historians, and even those people who just simply made your life better. You'll see this in the acknowledgement section of books, for example, where scholars often recognize their spouses and other family members, usually for love and support and time away. Specific librarians and archivists are outside readers, and in the case of my first book, the most important person I could think of, the inventor of spell check. Yes, I did misspell my wife's maiden name in my doctoral dissertation. Why do you ask? This brings us to the most important point of honest communication, the admonition to not plagiarize. Another lecture goes over the ins and outs of plagiarism, but even the AHA statement has a full section devoted to it. I'll not define plagiarism here, but borrow the ideas of the AHA statement to speak about the ethos that reduces the risk. Always, it reads, be explicit, thorough, and generous in acknowledging one's intellectual debts. When you adopt that attitude, you'll find you want to give rather than take credit for what is not original to you. Besides habits of mind, we should form habits of work that oppose shoddiness and sloth. This doesn't mean to work until you drop, but it does mean to not cut corners, even when the only thing you want to do is flee the project forever. Lastly, to avoid plagiarism, you must oppose deception in yourself and others. This is not a matter of merely protecting yourself. It's also not a matter of merely not practicing deception yourself, but of challenging deception in yourself and others. Soon you'll develop habits of mind through critical analysis and healthy skepticism that alert you to deception and sharp dealing. In summary, this lecture discusses one of the most important components of historical practice, professional or avocational, that is the historian's ethos. Combining ethics and method, ethos creates the historian's reputation as a trustworthy authority who is rigorously and critically honest, who treats the historical record and the historical enterprise with integrity, and who is transparent in the work. Historians manifest their ethos through honest scholarship that acknowledges their biases and follows the evidence, method, and analysis with courage. 
Historians also manifest their ethos through honest, generous, and transparent communication of their research findings. They oppose deception and shoddy work. This ethos is the mark of a trained historian. Pursue it throughout your life, and it will take you far, regardless of your circumstances. With that, we end the lecture. As always, thank you for your attention.